welcome to everybody to the Native Plant Society Austin chapter meeting. I am Celeste Brantzel, the president for another month or so, and yay, it'll be over. <laughs> and so our mission is to promote conservation research and the use of native plants and plant habitats of Texas through education, outreach, and example. So right now we are meeting online, but that might change, knock on wood. If things stay okay, we do have our meeting room back. It's a different room, but we do have it. We, we will be up at uh, Terrytown United Methodist Church, again, just in a different room, possibly come January. And can you see my, oh, I am screen sharing. So I should be able to, yes, okay. So at this point in the year when all the all the blooms are fading and just the, the there's the lone sunflower that's uh, hanging out with the uh, gulf muley I thought this was a kind of a fun fun little sad flower. So tonight's program we're going to have something about prescribed fire management and then we're going to have a little bit of business and then we're going to have a little bit of announcements. And so please Stick around for the entire the entire program. We need your we need your support. We need your presence. And let's see with that, I think I'm going to pass it over to Alice Markham, who can introduce our speakers for tonight. Uh, right, you want me to start, so let's, yes. Yeah. Um, interesting that you know, as Clarence was just saying, one of the uh, purposes of the purposes of our chapter as a 5013C charitable entity is to give grants to kind of appropriate people, appropriate um, functions. Early, at the, right before the pandemic, uh, we as a chapter gave grants to uh, Becca Carden and Whitney Bear, who are there on the screen. Um, they are both students, graduate students in Dr. Norma Fowler's um, lab. Uh, at UT Austin, uh, the Department of Integrative Biology. And today, having given, you know, the, the grants were kind of almost two years ago now, but today I'm excited to welcome both Becca and Whitney, who are going to be speaking to us about uh, prescribed fire for management of woodland and savannah ecosystems. So take it away, Whitney and Becca. I don't know which one of you is going to speak for us, but thank you. We're really pleased to have you here for talking to our chapter. Thank you so much, Alice, for that introduction. I will go first. Um, let me just share my screen here. You guys can see the, the full PowerPoint now, right? Okay, so yeah, Alice, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm, I'm Becca. Uh, like you said, I'm a PhD student in Dr. Fowler's lab at um, UT Austin in the plant biology program. Um, and before I start, I just wanted to like um, take a minute and say thank you so much for the generous grant that you guys um, gave me and Whitney. Uh, yeah, like you said, almost two years ago now, I was able to buy a GPS that I used for this field work and it paid for some of uh, my gas getting back and forth from the field site. So it really made this research possible and um, I really appreciate it. And I'm very excited to share with you some of the results from this work that you helped to fund. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about the long-term effects of prescribed burning and deer browsing on central Texas woodlands. And I wanted to start by talking about how woodlands are like a little different from forests. So woodlands are often characterized by short trees. Um, maybe the tallest trees are around 10 meters tall, which is about 30 feet and a relatively open canopy. So I think walking around woodlands um, here, sometimes the canopy is like quite shady, but it's still somewhat open compared to like a, a forest with a really dense canopy and a dark understory. And so in central Texas, we have these mixed uh, oak ash juniper woodlands, and they're important for many reasons, including the fact that they're breeding habitat for the endangered golden cheeked warbler. So this guy, and um, uh, one thing that, about warblers is that they prefer woodlands that have oaks in the canopy, as well as ash juniper. So that like um, in comparison to a woodland that's all ash juniper or mostly ash juniper in the canopy. 
So one conservation concern is that we're seeing something called oak regeneration failure, and we're seeing it in central Texas, but it's also been documented across the eastern and central United States. So what this means or what it refers to is the fact that there's like pretty commonly um, large mature oak trees in the canopy and often like small oak seedlings are very common on the floor of the woodland, but there's a lack of mid-sized oak saplings. And this is a problem because when those overstory oaks die, there's no large oaks like poised and ready to take their place in the canopy. And instead they're gonna be replaced by saplings from other species. So if you look at this figure on the left, this is from a publication by uh, Dr. Fowler and one of her past research, or sorry, graduate students, uh, Dr. Leland Russell. And these uh, graphs show the number of stems of different sized oaks at two sites in central Texas. And so you can see that at both sites, there's quite a few large oaks and even small oaks, but they're missing this mid-sized um, like sapling size class. And so that's what I'm referring to when I say oak regeneration failure. And because this is happening um, like in many parts of the country, there's a lot of people researching it, concerned about it, and there are several hypotheses for what could contribute to this phenomenon. So the first hypothesis is fire suppression. And studies have shown that fire can actually be like very helpful to oaks. And um, like, okay, why would fire help oaks? So if you Think about a seedling. A seedling has to do two things. It has to invest in above ground growth so it can get tall, intercept light, photosynthesize, and create energy. And it also has to invest in below ground growth, its root system, so that it can get water and nutrients from the soil. So as seedlings, many species invest quite a bit in that above ground growth right away. Um, and this way they can get tall and get that sunlight. But oaks from a very young age or many species of oaks invest like even as juveniles in large robust root systems. So why would they do this? It's a competitive disadvantage if they're surrounded by other seedlings of other species that are much taller than they are intercepting light and, and they don't have it like, you know, they're not getting as much light as they could. But it's a huge advantage if a fire comes along. So if a fire, like a surface fire burns through an area, it's going to knock back or what we call top kill, like the above ground growth of many species. And studies have shown that oaks like are prolific re-sprouters because they have these large root systems, they can re-sprout again and again and again after a fire. While their competitors might not be able to re-sprout at all or may only be able to re-sprout after like one or two fires. So fire may benefit oaks by opening up space in the understory and increasing light availability. And this could help seedlings grow up into the sapling size class. In contrast, uh, anthropogenic fire suppression, which became like very effective and widespread in the early 1900s might benefit oak competitors because it stops these fires and allows, um, allows those competitors to win the race for light. So this is one hypothesis of why there's a lack of saplings um, in, in oak populations across the country. A second hypothesis is that deer browsing could have something to do with this. So in the early 1900s, deer populations were really low due to overhunting. And because of laws and hunting regulations that were put into place to protect these populations, they rebounded and have exploded in the like past few decades. And like fire suppression, this is a national trend. So I live in Austin, probably most of you live in Austin. There are so many deer in my neighborhood. I, I bet you see them all the time too. So this is something that like really affects the Austin area specifically. Um, and so they could be, uh, you know, they could have something to do with oh, the oak regeneration failure that we're seeing here and elsewhere. And the way that they could affect oak populations is by creating something called a browse line. So. Uh, basically, the point here is that deer are most likely to eat or often likely to eat the food that is like literally right in front of their face. And so what this does is it can create a line, like a, a height to which the understory can grow before it's browsed by deer. 
So you might walk through woodlands around here or forest in other parts of the country with really big deer populations and be able to see that the understory vegetation is cut off at like knee height or thigh height. And that could be because of um, deer browse. Or it could be this browse line that I'm referring to. And you can imagine that if you're a sapling trying to grow into the, or if you're a seedling, sorry, trying to grow into the sapling size class, this would um, prevent that. And deer do commonly browse oaks. So they may also be contributing to the lack of saplings that we see in oak populations. So the big question is, can prescribed fire, deer population management, or a combination of these two techniques be used to encourage oak canopy recruitment? And um, actually a lot of research has looked at like the, uh, the effect of prescribed fire on oaks and results are sometimes mixed. So like sometimes it can increase the number of saplings that you see in an area. And sometimes it doesn't, it has less effective results. And very little research has assessed how prescribed fire might interact with deer um, to affect oak populations. So like I said, this is of national conservation concern and specifically locally, it's of concern to inform management for high quality golden cheek warbler habitat. That is those woodlands with oaks in the canopy. So uh, Dr. Fowler and one of her previous grad students, Dr. Christina Andruck, collaborated with some scientists and land managers at the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge to try to um, investigate this question. Um, and so this, Wildlife Refuge is here. It's about an hour northwest of Austin. And like many uh, woodlands in the area, the sloped woodlands in the refuge are dominated in the canopy by ash juniper and Texas red oak. And there's also some other canopy trees like black cherry. Um, it's pretty common. And there's this like wonderful um, understory of, uh, of like shrubs and small trees, such as Carolina buckthorn, possum haw, and Texas persimmon. So at the refuge, and here this is a map of the refuge, and the red square is where the study is taking place. And here are the, um, the plots for the study. So in 2009, they established 10 plots, um, and they monitored these plots to look at the species composition and also the number of seedlings, saplings, and mature trees of different woody species. Um, and then in 2010, they installed this deer fence. They also randomly selected five plots inside the fence and applied five plots outside of the fence to burn. So what they ended up with was five plots that were fenced and burned, five plots that were fenced but not burned, five plots that were burned but not fenced, and five plots that were controls that were neither fenced or burned. And this is a really great study design to address that question that I was just talking about. This prescribed fire deer exclusion or a combination of these management techniques result in an increased number of oak saplings. So um, a little bit more about the burn treatments. They, these plots were actually thinned and burned. So they first went in and cut the juniper saplings, then slash was distributed on the, um, on the ground within plots. And they were really careful not to like pile slash next to a large mature tree that they wanted to protect or something like that. Um, they let the slash dry for a couple of months and then they went in and burned it. And so in the publication that they wrote up on this project, which was published in 2014, they said that plots received moderate to moderate high burn intensity. And they monitored plots for five years. So I would say this is like a really great paper. Um, and if you're interested in this question, you should look it up um, and, and, and give it a read because it uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm just gonna share with you one of their results because I think it's relevant to the rest of the, um, the rest of this presentation. So this is a graph from the paper of the average number of hardwood saplings in uh, different treatments over the five years of the study. So we have the control fence burn and burn fence treatments. And you can see that in the fenced treatments, by the end of the study, by 2013, there were significantly more hardwood saplings than there were at the beginning of the study in 2009, before the fencing and the burning took place. And this effect was greatest um, in the plots that were both burned and fenced. Those are the plots that on average had the highest number of hardwood saplings. So I think this is pretty cool. This indicates that like perhaps both prescribed burning and deer population management 
are um, needed to get the, the highest number of hardwood saplings possible in your plots, if that's your management goal. I would say, obviously, I think we all know tree growth is a long, slow process. Also, some research suggests that one burn doesn't really have long-term effects. Like some, some managers and some systems um, suggest burning two or three times to, to, uh, to increase oak growth. So I think what um, doctors uh, Fowler and Andruck and the collaborators at the uh, Balcones Canyonlands uh, Refuge, what they were wondering is, did these treatments have long-term effects? Like, could we go back there today and still see a difference between these four different plot types? So I was very privileged when I got to UT as a grad student to be asked to collaborate on this project and uh, returned to these plots this summer, 11 years after the fence and burn treatments were um, initiated. And at this point, I also want to say I didn't do this alone. I did it with an undergraduate named Lee Kaplan, who, um, who has put a lot of work into this project as well. So I wanted to give him a shout out. And so what did we see? Well, the treatments continue to affect the number and the species of the saplings that are present in each plot. So this is a graph of the average number of ash juniper saplings per plot in 2021. And you can see that in the plots that were burned, regardless of fencing, the number of juniper saplings is still very low compared to the unburned plots. And remember these plots were not just burned, but also thin and burned and the thin treatment like specifically targeted juniper saplings. So, so far they have not um, rebounded. So this indicates that perhaps these treatments, the, the burn treatment specifically, um, can have an effect in the long term to reduce ash juniper competition with oaks. On average, the burned and fenced plots also still had um, the highest number of hardwood saplings. So here on the left, you can see a graph of the average number of Texas red oak saplings per plot. And on average, the uh, these were most abundant in the plots still that were fenced and burned. And then on the right, you can see the average number of hardwood saplings per plot, excluding Texas red oak. So this is like the black cherry, the, um, the possum haw, and those other great plants that I was talking about. And you can see that these also are the most, on average, most common in the plots that were fenced and burned. And I have to say that in, in this particular treatment, it was mostly possum haw that was present. Um, and one more note that I wanted to make is that these graphs look like um, they, they sh they're showing very similar trends, but the scale is really different. So in these um, burn and fence plots, hardwoods other than Texas red oak, we could have counted a hundred of them or sometimes 300 saplings uh, aside from Texas red oak. Well, even in the burned and fenced plots, the highest number of Texas red oak saplings that we saw was about 18. So they're, they're similar, but not exactly the same pattern here. So some preliminary conclusions. Um, Texas red oaks were still the most common in plots that were both fenced and burned, perhaps due to a combination of reduced competition from ash juniper, from the burning and thinning treatments, and also protection from deer browse. And I think this is a, a cool finding for a couple of reasons. First of all, it implies that this combination of treatments works in the long term. Um, so that's great. And additionally, it can also inform management, especially in um, the Austin area in central Texas, um, to foster healthy Texas red oak populations and also to manage for high quality golden sheep warbler habitat. Uh, another conclusion is that these other hardwoods, especially possum haw, um, also were very common in the same plots, those plots that were burned and fenced. So that might indicate that this species also re-sprouts like very well after fire and also benefits from protection from deer browse. And at this point, uh, possum haw may be competing the most with oaks. So as I go through grad school, I'm learning that um, you, you do an experiment that sort of like points you to maybe the answer to your original question. And then it gives you like 10 more questions that you want to ask. So this is, you know, this points to potential future research. Like um, what are oaks um, competing heavily with possum haw right now? Would more treatments like another burn treatment or thinning reduce the possum haw um, and, and increase the number of oak saplings even further? Is that um, a management 
goal that's interesting to land managers in this region? So these are open questions that, um, that I've taken from this result. Um, another important take home, I think, is that deer have a huge impact on plant populations and species composition. So this includes the woody trees and shrubs that I've been talking about, but of course they also affect herbaceous plant populations quite a bit. And perhaps these results can inform the management of your garden. <laughs> so maybe if you're an avid gardener, you already have a fence around your garden or you do something else to scare away the deer. Like my parents have disposable um, cake tins that they've tied up to bang together to try to get deer away from their garden. But, um, but if you're not managing deer on your own, um, yet, then perhaps, uh, perhaps that would help to increase the uh, growth of all these plants that you're nurturing in your garden. So with that, I want to say thank you so much again for listening to this presentation. Thank you to, um, to Norma and also to her previous grad students who really paved the way for this project, to Lee Kaplan, that undergraduate, um, and to all of the collaborators at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and in Norma's lab that have um, contributed to this. And like, I really just wanna end by saying thank you so much again for this grant that like um, was, was really important to funding this project and, and contributed a great deal to this research. So I hope, you're, um, I hope you're interested to see some of the results of that. And with that, maybe I will turn it over to Whitney. I did notice there were some questions. I don't know if you want to answer those now or if we want to wait till after I'm done to do questions, whatever um, you would like. Uh, yeah, so I had the, the presentation on full screen, so I did not see questions while I was speaking, but I guess that's up to uh, up to Alice and Celeste. Yeah, and I, can, I can read the questions if you'd like, Becca. Yeah. Um, so the first question, and you may have, touched on this in the, uh, your presentation uh, from Kathleen Tr Kathy Trisner. How do you differentiate the effect of cutting cedar versus burning? Yeah, I think that is like a really good question. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely interested in that too, because this, I have been calling it a burn treatment, but I wanted to make sure to note that it was really a thin end burn treatment. And I don't think this experiment was really designed to, um, to like, figure out what the different results from those two management techniques are. Um, and so I think probably further research would be needed to, to address that. Um, and then Kathy also asked, are there any live oaks in the plots? Yeah, so um, I think mm, there's a plot with shin oak in it. So that was a burned plot and it re-sprouted like prolifically, so um, which you would expect from Shin Oak. I don't think that any of the plots have live oak. I might have seen one live oak seedling that was only like 10 centimeters tall. So this is not um, not a good good experiment to measure the how live oak responds to fire, but um, I do see a lot of live oak out there. So <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, and then uh, Phyllis asked, and again, you may have mentioned this at the, be the beginning, how big are the plots? Oh, yeah. No, thank you. That's a great question. And I did not mention it. So they're um, 11 meters radius. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty large plot. So 11, 10 meters radius would be like 30 feet. So I think 11 meters is about 30 feet. And then you double that. So they're 66 feet in diameter. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, then Celeste asked, and I think this may be, okay, why do red oaks have such low recruitment numbers? Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question. I'm, so I really think there's a lot of seedlings out there. So I really think there's some problem with, with getting the seedlings to the sapling size class. Like this is the, the place where, um, where like the, the population is being restricted. There's some issue with that. So it could be competition, which, which fire would help with. It could be deer browsing. Um, I think that's the, that's the golden question. That's what everybody wants to know. Um, and then I think this may be, yeah, this is the last question. 
how many saplings were from reese sprouts versus from acorn seeds? Yeah, that's also a great question. So all of the saplings that I showed, those were all from seed. Um, reese sprouts, I measured separately and didn't didn't present any results from that tonight. So this is all from all from seed. And did, did you say early on that uh, you talked about live oaks and reese sprouts, that, that is the live oak tree that has a good uh, rate of re-sprouting? Or was that, um, just oak, was that just oaks in general? I think oaks, oaks in general, oaks in general have, are very okay. good at re-sprouting. Okay. Yeah, and Texas red oak is a, is a great re-sprouter. There were lots of re-sprouts um, in, yeah, in, yeah. in the plots attached to, to like large overstory trees. In other experiments, we have seen live oak re-sprout uh, very well in savannas. And over in Bastrop, we've seen um, Margareta, the uh, sand um, post oak re-sprout gangbusters. Uh, it's, it's a thing that oaks do. So pretty much um, all of our native oaks. So do we have any more questions? Uh, okay, well, good. Thank you, Becca. That was really interesting. Yeah, really thank you, guys. It, I found myself thinking, how, how can I do this, you know, in my own garden? And I guess, I mean, I know that's not the point, but it would make, you know, it would make sort of, I think it would make for very good results if there was some means of doing this, you know, on, on a kind of domestic basis. Um, so uh, moving on to Whitney, and yeah, well, I can see that you're sharing your screen, Whitney, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Becca. That was great. And I also, uh, you did a good amount of background information about fire being important, so that'll speed things up for me a little bit. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Whitney Baer. Um, I'm also in Norma's lab. I'm a PhD candidate in plant biology. And I also got a thousand dollar grant from Nipsot last February, right before the pandemic started. And then of course we weren't able to do our field work for a year. And then we finally were able to get out there this year. Um, and so I was able to actually spend that money. And it was mostly my, my, um, uh, my mileage back and forth to the, um, uh, to the uh, wildlife refuge, the one that uh, Becca was just talking about. So I'm gonna share some of the projects I've been working on. Um, and they are generally about the effects of prescribed fire on grassland plant communities in Central Texas. So um, I'm talking mostly about grasslands and savannas, and we just heard from Becca about uh, woodlands, but fire is also very important in grasslands and savannas. Um, and, it, and one of the main things it does is maintains it as an open grassland. Uh, the grasslands of North America were maintained as open habitats uh, by fire for you know, really long periods of these species evolutionary histories. And in many places in North America, there is enough precipitation in the climate to support forests. Um, but we know from the soils that there are, were not forests there and they were grasslands. And we you know, know that they, if they're grasslands now, of course we know they're grasslands now. Um, and um, it's really pretty well supported that fire was the, the thing keeping those grasslands from turning into forests. So when we did have this widespread fire suppression um, that we were really so successful at over the last hundred, hundred or so years, um, that has had numerous effects on our grassland plant communities. And um, one of those is that, you know, woody plants come in, it's a process called woody encroachment, and um, they'll establish this thicker canopy and sun loving species and fire dependent species might be lost from the grassland plant communities. And this, of course, will lead to overall reduced plant diversity. Um, returning fire to grasslands has had has, uh, many benefits, and they can include maintaining this open canopy or lack of canopy, I guess would be a better way to say it, um, but also increased native species richness. And in some cases, but not all cases, and I'll get into this in a minute, uh, reduced abundance of invasive species. Returning fire to these landscapes, of course, comes with many challenges, especially because, you know, in most of these places, these are places where people live. So they might be against the law or there might be policies or there's public perception. People might be scared. They, you know, some of these fires that they see on TV out west can be really scary looking. Um, of course, in the Austin area, we had the, the wildfires in 2011. So people are, are pretty sensitive about uh, wildfires and they may not realize that 
wildfires and prescribed fires are completely different animals and prescribed fires are very uh, controlled. Um, sometimes they're very expensive to do them right and to do them safely. Um, and in some cases, we've got situations where the plant communities have changed so much from fire suppression that they can't even carry a fire, even if one were to, you know, we were try to we would try to go in there and do a prescribed fire. So there's a lot of challenges there. Um, and very importantly, we need to know will it work to achieve whatever our restoration goals might be with these um, plant communities. Um, and really common goals are maintaining these open grasslands and conserving native grassland and savanna species. So um, I'm going to talk about two projects that I've been working on since I've been here. Um, one is this, it's a collaboration with um, the, the JAW lab. Uh, me and uh, Norman mentioned earlier that we've been working with this other lab that does pollinator stuff and I'm doing kind of the plant side of it. And that's more of a short term look at um, these 10 locations across central Texas and up into Southern Oklahoma. And then very briefly, I'll touch on the second project I'm working on, um, which is a bit of a longer term look about 12 years of, um, I don't have 12 years of data, but it's like, we've got data from 2009 and we've got data from this year. So it's longer term. So there it goes. So this first project, uh, these are my sites here on this map. It goes from you, Austin is there at the bottom and then our little, um, uh, red triangles go up to Oklahoma. So there's 10 sites. They're kind of all over the place, but they're in. We tried to get them in the um, Cross Timbers eco region. And for the most part, they were uh, pretty, pretty consistently in the Cross Timbers eco region. Um, we burned and seeded uh, in um, here. I have my, my treatments here somewhere. There they are. Okay. So we had three plots at each site. So 30 total across the 10. And at each site, we had one plot we just burned, one plot where we burned, and then we put native uh, form seeds in, and then one plot where we didn't do anything. So we did all these treatments in the spring of 2018. Um, and those little dates, they might be really hard for you to see. I realize they might be quite small. Um, those are the burn dates for each of those sites. And the seeding always took place after the birds were completed. So we, um, we surveyed the plant communities, all of these sites in fall 2017, before we did these treatments. Then we monitored the plant communities at these sites for two years. And we did surveys in both um, spring, and, sorry, summer and fall, June and September of 2018 and 2019. I won't get into too much detail about our sampling techniques, but basically we did the kind of standard thing everybody does where we identified all the vascular plants um, at, in, in this case, we, it was at 204 points in each plot to get, and we got a sense of both richness and abundance of the species we were working with. I know since we're the Native Plant Society, you wanna know what plants uh, were in our seed list. So here's our list um, of what we planted after we burned. But that's not as interesting as looking at the pictures. So I'll give you a second to enjoy these pictures of all these beautiful native forms we planted. It's really common in seed lists for there to be grasses, but we chose to leave the grasses out of the seed list and only plant forbs. Um, since there's some, there's some quite a lot of data actually that um, grasses in the seed, li seed, li seed mixes can overtake um, really quickly and establish really quickly. And that might be at the expense of the forbs. So we thought um, only including forbs would be useful in this case. And if these species were chosen. There are a lot of ways in which these species were chosen. Um, we are looking for a variety of bloom timing, a variety of life history strategies. And also we wanted stuff that was really good at establishing. So some of these species are similar to ones that are used by TxDOT in roadside revegetation projects. So if you're not familiar with this crazy graph, um, I will walk you through it. It's, it's, uh, it's a little much possibly, <laughs> but basically what this one does is it groups together similar plant communities. So the little black dots on here are species and the bigger codes like 3B, 1S, all that, those are um, plot names. Um, the, the sites are numbered from southernmost to northernmost, so one, is our southernmost site. Uh, so 1C would be the control at our southernmost site. 10B would be the burn plot at our northernmost site, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
What's cool here is that, so I've put these little squares um, attaching all the different um, treatments. And this is showing that um, all of these boxes are overlapping so much. And that tells us that the treatments were not, the plant communities were not very different among our different treatment plots. Um, so telling us that our treatments really didn't do much for our plant communities. By contrast, if I take that, this is the same scatter of, of plant species, same scatter of plots, and I put circles around plots at each site. So you'll notice all the tens are together, all the threes are together, so, so on and so forth, um, that we, we see there's a pretty consistent clustering here. So really what this is saying is possibly you know, unsurprising to anyone who's driven around and looked at plants, um, which I'm sure most of you have, that um, the sites are different from each other along, um, along our latitudinal gradient. So um, our treatments didn't really do much and our, our sites are, are pretty different from each other. Um, I did wanna zoom in a little bit on the seeded species. And uh, we did see a significant um, effect of our, our seeding treatment, um, but it waited until June, 2019 to uh, make itself known. Um, this graph on the left here is, um, all of our, all of our I, I grouped all the seeded species together, and then this was just the abundance of, of anything on that seed list that showed up. So it's just a raw kind of um, sum, and then this is relative abundance out of 204, how many of those were these seeded species. The blue bars are our burn and seed plots. The red bars are the burn only plots, and the gray bars are the controls. So you'll notice we planted our seeds in um, there. There's a little green arrow there in um, the spring of 2018. And then nothing much happened. The plots were not that different from each other. We didn't see a, really any um, seeded species showing up. And then June 2019, um, it rained. And so we saw a response. Um, and that, that tall blue bar there tells us that the, the seeded plots had more seeded species in them than the other plots um, in total. And of course, um, I mean, it probably will, will come as no surprise to anyone who lives in central Texas, but droughts are pretty standard and our, you know, our plants might wait to respond um, until there's sufficient water. So I, uh, I pulled this data on the, on the right from the US drought monitor. And these, this is just a percent of um, my, my 10 sites that were in different drought categories um, at each of these different time points. So, um, you know, throughout, you can see throughout much of 2018, 80% of my sites were in somewhere between abnormally dry and extreme drought. And then by June, 2019, it's 0%. Absolutely none of my sites were in drought in June, 2019. Um, and so of course that it seems a reasonable, as reasonable explanation as any as to why, uh, why we didn't see our seeded species do anything until later. So just to demonstrate what I'm talking about, this is one of my sites, this background picture I've been using this whole time. This one is um, a private ranch outside of Mineral Wells. And it looks like this picture was taken in 2018. And um, it looks like maybe one species of grass, maybe two species, you're not really seeing very many flowers. And then one year later, same, same place, I took this picture and granted it's, you know, during the day and everything, but you can see there's tons of flowers, lots of different species. You can, you know, if you've got a really keen eye, you can see different species of um, everything coming in, even if it doesn't have flowers on it. So it's just really, um, really dramatic what happens when, when it rains. I know I'm not blowing anyone's mind with the fact that plants need water, but that's one of the, <laughs> one of the important results here. Um, so now what I want to do is zoom in even closer on this June, 2019, result here and show you what which species of my 13 were showing up in that big tall blue bar there in our in our uh, burn and seed plots. So um, on the x-axis here we've got our site names and on the y-axis we have relative abundance um, and again that's out of out of 204 in each of my plots. Um, the first thing you might notice is that there are eight bars here and I, you, you're like, I, I feel like she might have said she had 10 sites and I did say that. Two of those sites, we didn't see any seeded species at all in our 
surveys. So that's a keen eye if you notice that, and that we notice that as well. Um, so the other thing you're noticing probably is that it's just one or two species at each site that were really driving this big, you know, result. Um, and uh, the bar all the way over on the right is um, one site where it was just uh, partridge pea. Basically, I don't think there was anything other than partridge pea that was showing up that in um, uh, uh, the summer of 2019. The one in the middle there, that tall uh, kind of greenish teal bar, that's just coreopsis um, and, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of interesting. I mean, if you're using one seed mix across 10 sites, across a 300 mile um, gradient, you're going to see that especially different sites are, they've got different land use histories. They've got different soils. They're at different latitudes. They're getting different rainfall. They're, you know, they're different in all kinds of ways and different species are going to respond differently to, um, to those differences among sites. So of course, you know, when choosing a seed mix for this many sites, it's, it's really difficult. So what you might want to do is um, make sure you get a good variety. But, and so it seemed like we, we might've done that here. Um, another interesting result is that our species richness, um, which is just the, the raw number of species at each plot, we just sort of count them, um, uh, that had a um, positive relationship with latitude. You'll see on the left side of the, the x-axis is our southernmost sites and the right side of the x-axis is our northernmost sites um, and the species richness is there on the on the left, that's just number of species in each plot. And so we had more species at our northernmost sites. And this may not um, shock you unless you are familiar with ecological theory, where we, um, we would generally expect from the ecological theory to have um, more species closer to the equator. So this is kind of an interesting reversal of what we, um, what we normally would expect along our, our 300 mile latitudinal gradient. One possible explanation is we notice there's this um, opposite relationship that this uh, invasive grass, King Ranch Blue Stem, uh, Othricloa ishmum, has with our with latitude at our sites as well. So we had more of this invasive grass at our southernmost sites and and less of it at our northernmost sites. And so it's possible that um, invasive grasses have the power to override our expected ecological patterns of species richness. Um, so that's just, that's a, a pattern that we're gonna um, keep an eye on. And it might be, um, I mean, obviously concerning because it's invasive species and they are a concern, but um, an intriguing pattern to pay attention to. So some uh, quick conclusions from this study are that um, we just did, in our, our fires were just single fires. We just did one and we did them in the dormant season in the spring. And so they, those types of fires just may not be able to shift community composition in these areas. Um, additionally, plants need water. Sites in this semi-arid region may require precipitation above certain threshold before they're able to respond to restoration treatments like fire and seeding. So maybe patience is the key here. Maybe it will respond. You just have to wait for that big rain to come. And um, our sites were different, but some of our results were similar across sites. So there is um, an encouraging possibility of um, generalizable effective techniques in this region. So I'll just zoom right into my second project. This also takes place at the um, Bacones Canyon Lands National Wildlife Refuge, where Becca was just talking about her work. This project was also started by Dr. Andrick in 2009. She was really busy that year, burning a lot of stuff. Um, and we're really grateful to her because um, we're going back and checking the, the responses um, all these years later. Um, so these... Um, the, the, there's a hundred of these, or sorry, there's 80 of these plots in this little, and, and I guess there really isn't a scale on here, um, but this is about a mile radius where all these little plots are. And they're, they're like a, a meter by two meters. Um, they're really small little guys. And um, what she did was she, uh, I randomly identify or 
randomly selected all these and um, half of them were native dominated and half of them were dominated by that invasive grass, King Ranch blue stem. And so then of those, she split them in half again and she burned half of those and she left the other half unburned. So kind of similar to Becca's situation where there was four you know, possibilities you could have an invasive dominated burn plot, invasive dominated unburned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's, we got the triangles, the circles for burned and unburned and the color coding for um, in native dominated and invasive dominated. Um, so these fires took place in July of 2009. So these are growing season fires, um, which there's some in in encouraging data showing that those are, are more effective in this region. Um, and then this, um, Whole, this whole study area was burned uh, again by refuge staff just as part of their regular management ta uh, tactics in January of 2014 and January 2017. So those are dormant season fires again. Um, and so the data I have here is uh, 2009 plant community data that was taken before the fires, before this um, July fire 2009. Then Dr. Andrick came back two years later and um, it did the same plant community survey uh, two years post burn in 2011. And then I went back this summer and did a uh, plant community survey um, of these, of all these plots. So that'll be 12 years later. And these, <laughs> these analyses are so preliminary that I did them last week, but here, but I'm going to share with you what I've got. Um, so this is another one of those NMDS plots that, like I said, just clusters similar communities together. The, um, the black, I think they're green, actually, it doesn't matter. The small dots are the species, and then there's like little blue circles that are the plots because there's so many of them. But anyway, I, I drew circles around the, the plots that had been burned in 2009 and the ones that, that, that were not burned in 2009, and you're seeing almost perfect overlap. There's just no difference in the 2021 plant community data um, between the, the plots that were burned back then. Um, but if I split it up by the ones that were deemed um, invasive dominated in 2009 versus the ones that were deemed native dominated in 2009, they don't overlap quite so much. The native dominated circle is wider, telling me there's more species in it, um, it or you know more potential species in it, and uh, so they, those that, that was kind of a clue that these. Um, the native dominated plants plots from 2009 might still be native dominated. And I was noticing this too, just when I was walking around out there that, um, that that might be the case. Cause obviously a, a King Ranch blue stem dominated area. If any of you have been knee deep in it, uh, it's pretty evident when it's dominated by King Ranch blue stem and when it's not. So, um, what I did was I just took the, um, Again, that species richness metric, the, just the, the raw count of number of species per plot. Um, and I looked at uh, 2009, 2011, and this year, and it looks like they, that number has been increasing throughout the, the years. Of course, I don't have any data between 2011 and this year. It'd be kind of interesting to see what it did in the meantime, but this was pretty cool. So then I was like, all right, let me look at the... Um, uh, the burn versus unburned plots. And again, this was, these are from the 2009 burns. I didn't burn them again myself. Um, but so we've, we were seeing that increase in species richness over time. Um, you can see in 2009, the burn and unburned plots were pretty much the same uh, over, over uh, average. And then they, they, they're a little different from each other, but not significantly so in um, 2011 and 2021. But then I wanted to look at that uh, native and invasive dominated metric. And they're really, um, it's a little bit more striking here, which is pretty cool. Um, so they started off real different in 2009. You can see the, the invasive dominated one is that, that peach colored box. And it's way down there, species richness of an average of maybe what, two, something like that. Um, whereas the in native dominated plots had an average of uh, 10 species per plot. And of course, you know, they're, they're going up over time. Um, everybody's going up over time, but they're, they're kind of remaining different from each other. So um, it's, it's possible those, those, um, uh, the dormant season fires that happened in, you know, in the intervening years um, kind of brought everybody up. It's possible. There's all kinds of uh, cool things going on here. Um, but those, those, those native dominated plots consistently have more species than the uh, invasive dominated plots, even still to this day. 
So there's, I mean, like I said, I just did these analyses last week. So um, there's a lot more to explore. Um, the, um, the 2009 summer fires may have, um, you know, there still might be an effect of those fires that's detectable today in the, you know, in these, these increasing um, species richness levels. Um, and I just want to look at in what ways are the effects of the 2009 fire still detectable in the plant community. Um, I'm really interested in if I can figure out what possibly is keeping the, the invasive species out of those native dominated plots because 12 years is a lot, is, should be plenty of time for um, King Ranch Blue Stem to do its thing and um, come in and dominate those other areas, especially because there's just so much of it out there and those invasive dominated pl plots are right next to the native dominated plots. So it's really interesting to, to look at maybe what's keeping the, the KR out of there. Um, and just what else has changed since 2009 and uh, possibly more importantly, what has not changed? So um, there's a lot to look at in this project, this one I just started. Some overall conclusions um, that, of course, fire can be a useful tool for increasing native species richness in some of our local grasslands, but not all fires are created equal. Those dormant season fires may not do what we hope. Um, and there's, there's other qualities fires can have, including the, the timing, uh, not just the timing in the year, but how often, how many, you know, do you do it every year? Do you do it every five years? So um, there's a lot of details to be kind of hammered out there in using this tool for increasing native species richness. And of course, water is a critical part of the uh, restoration story in this region. And, um, you know, what, what happens if it doesn't rain after a fire or a seeding treatment? Um, is it that we'll still get the, the same response at some point or will we get a diminished response? Are the animals out there eating all the seeds after we put them down if they don't get a chance to germinate right away? There's a lot of um, stuff to look at there. And, if, and, this, and this idea that our invasive grasses might, um, might be able to override our expected ecological patterns is, is pretty concerning. So it's not like controlling invasive species has ever been a low priority, but I would just say it remains a high priority um, in this region. So uh, that's it. I just want to thank the uh, NIPSOT once again for, um, for the, the grant last year. That was really helpful in um, helping me with this research and um, all the landowners that I've worked with and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, the, the JAW Lab, the Fowler Lab, um, and uh, yeah, everyone, everyone who's helped along the way. <laughs> So I can, uh, I can take questions. Thank now. you, Whitney. Do you want me to go ahead and read the questions for you? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, right, let me just... Um... Okay, so the first question from uh, Dick Davis was, as I understand, I don't want to miss it yet. Why were there no summer burns? That's the burn regime that would be most frequent without human intervention. Um, wh why were there no summer burns in my projects? Is that the question? Yes. Um, so yeah, in the in the first project, um, I didn't really get to decide that. <laughs> so that's why, because that's that's when I would have um, you know preferred to burn to see the the most effects in our in our plant communities. Um, but I think the 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 overall goal of that project was for to see the effects of typical uh, restoration activities on pollinator communities. So, and because of burn bans and other kinds of stuff and safety, most of the fires that do happen that are prescribed fires, um, those do happen during the dormant season now. So I think that's what that project was overall trying to get at. Um, and, um, and I guess I, I, you know, at least from the plant perspective, we, we have yet to see from the pollinator perspective what happened, but that dormant season fire really didn't do much that we could that we could detect. I do agree with you that the summer burns would have been more common um, pre-settlement based on um, what native, what we know native, native Americans were doing um, to maintain grasslands and um, of course, other natural causes of fires. And in the second project that, that was a, a summer burn in 2009, um, but then the refuge just um, as part of their normal way of doing things burns in the dormant season. So they did, that was their 2014 and 2017 fires. Um, and then the next question, which I think also relates to your, your, the first part of your presentation, 
uh, what data are available to show origin of soils from grasses? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I can, Norma, you want to help me out with that one? Because <laughs> I, can, I can dig it up, but I can't, I can't think off the top of my head what, where I got that from. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have lectured on this. Yeah, that's why um, I thought you might be able to help me with this one. Yeah. There is a, a system of classifying soils and prairie soils, grassland soils classify as mollusks. If you learned all this, like I did back in college, those were called churnazem. Forest soils al are called alpha solids in the USDA system we use now. Um, but the, the point is that Soil scientists have worked this out. Soil science is a science of its own right. And a prairie soil has, um, one thing it tends to be a different color because it has a much higher um, uh, humus content. It's deeper. It has a different crumb structure um, due to the <clears throat> stuff that grass are putting, grasses are putting into the soil. Grasses have very fine roots and they break down to give these very characteristic soils that are in fact the best agricultural soil, which is why we have no tall grass prairies almost left because it's the best soil for corn and soybeans. Um, anyway, it, you know, that's a very short answer, but the soil scientists, you know, there's your first course has got a textbook that thick, but both chemically and physically, um, the soils are different. Um, and uh, both at the microscopic and the macroscopic level. Okay, nice. so, thank you, Norma. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you have deep, deep, it takes time to build soil. The estimate is that prairie soil, you get an inch of topsoil every century. So when you find the prairie soils, grassland soils, and they have deep, deep A horizons, the topsoil, the A horizons, technical name, it's deep. You know that it's thousands and thousands of years to build that, that, that soil that deep. So if you get grass came in on top of forest soil or vice versa, you can see the, the change in the layers. Good, thanks. Um, Sorry, I don't know, you're fine. The next a, question was an uh, from Phyllis, Phyllis uh, Shung. Does burning help at all with KR blue stem management? Yeah, that's very much the um, uh, all fires are not created equal question that we're kind of feverishly trying to answer in the region. So um, an, an, another person in my lab, um, Carolyn Whiting, has been working on this question. And there's a, a few other people in the region who've been really aggressively uh, working on it. And the answer, of course, as, as in everything in biology, is it depends. Um, if you do a, um, a summer burn, like in July through October, that does show, we've, we've got some data that shows that that'll knock back uh, King Ranch Blue Stem pretty well, um, at least in the short term. We, we don't really have our long-term data yet, but it, you know, if it gets knocked back enough, maybe it can stay knocked back. Hopefully it doesn't come back in. Um, but these dormant season fires, like in January through March, like I did for my project, um, don't appear to really touch it at all. And some people have even said it might actually do the opposite and encourage KR blue stem. Um, and Dick Davis has commented, and I'm not sure if he can, you know, access, um, access the meeting. So I'm just going to read his comment. He says, and I don't know if this is the Dick Davis who works at the Wildflower Center. Um, from my observations, winter burns encourage KR, summer burns sometimes discourage KR, but often encourage silky blue stem and um, multistar thistle, I think is what that means. The silky blue stem seems to not exclude other species as much as KR. So that's... Sounds reasonable. You should, you should really ask Carolyn. Um, <laughs> to come and talk if that's what people are interested in, because the focus of her dissertation research is um, to compare fires at different um, times of year on the effects of KR. 
we thought perhaps that fires, this is, I'm channeling Carolyn Whiting now. We, we thought that um, the fire at the beginning of the growing season, after they run down their stored resources and haven't had time to rebuild them would be the most effective. And that did not turn out to be true. We also thought that the hottest fires would, the most intense would be the most effective. And that did not turn out to be true. And, you know, so neither the, neither the physiological nor the fire intensity counts for why the October burn was by far the most effective. Um, ecology is great. You think you know what you're doing and then nature throws a, <laughs> throws you a curveball. It's extremely humbling work. <laughs> it is. Um, interestingly enough, the fire that Whitney talked about, the, the fires they did for Christina did knock back KR successfully. And they were very, very happy about that at the refuge. That, that you know, that, that those were. But we're so, still... Um, our, our next question is from Celeste, and I'm, I'm assuming this is for the first part of the uh, of Whitney's presentation. Did your seed mix, so Whitney, did your seed mix add any new species to the native species that were previously detected? Yeah, for the most part, um, except for I think um, partridge pea and Indian blanket, which of course are pretty ubiquitous, <laughs> ubiquitous in the region. Um, most of those species were new to those sites or at least had not been detected in our um, pre-fire surveys in fall of 2017. Um, and then I think this is the, yeah, this is the last question. Uh, what is the grazing history past and present? Yeah, so that we did end up, I didn't mention this because I, you know, needed to cut for time, but uh, we did ask our landowners um, the management history of their sites. So of, of our 10 sites, um, four of them were privately owned, six of them were publicly owned. A lot of those were um, Army Corps of Engineers reservoirs. And so we asked them fire history, flood history, and grazing history. And um, unsurprisingly, at the, at the private sites, we had the landowners reporting, yes, we've had grazing here in the last five years. And at a lot of the um, public sites, they, the landowners reported, no, we have not had grazing here in the last five years. Um, but beyond that, we don't have more information from those sites about, um, other than what the landowners reported to us about the, the management history. And we also don't have grazing intensity or frequency information. We don't have stocking rate information. We just know it's a binary grazing, yes or no. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly a good question and a really important aspect of land management in our region. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Any, any last questions? Uh, well, thank you both, uh, Beck and Whitney. We, uh, really, really interesting talks. And thank you for taking the time out of your obviously very busy schedule <laughs> to, to come and talk to us. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you very much.